This is season two of My Only Story. It is a co-production between the My Only Story non-profit company and News24. If you'd like to donate towards our work, please visit our website at myonlystory.org. You can support us in other ways by reviewing, liking, and sharing the podcast and helping to spread the word. You can also engage with us on our social platforms or message us confidentially on 071-382-7030. We'd love to hear from you. This is a trigger warning. If you are a survivor of abuse, or if you know the people involved in the story, this podcast could be hard to listen to. It also discusses suicide and suicidal ideation, which some people might find troubling. If anything comes up for you while listening to this episode, please find someone to talk to at myonlystory.org. It is early summer, November 2017, and we are in green and rocky mountains outside Grahamstown. It's a sunny day, but also it is windy. Today, David McKenzie has a plan, and he's making Thomas Kruger help him. It's the final year of Tom's life. In seven months' time, David McKenzie will leave St. Andrews. And in 11 months and three weeks, Thomas will hang himself at the school sanatorium. In the mountains, the man and the boy reach a rock where they're hanging a ridge, and then the boy takes out a camera. McKinsey is wearing a pair of floral shorts and a fairly tight black t-shirt that shows off his biceps. Thomas trains his lens on his teacher on a gorge in floral shorts. As he starts to film, McKinsey addresses the camera with a winning smile. Hello, Survivor. My name is David McKenzie. I'm 29 years old. I'm from Port Elizabeth, South Africa. I'm currently working as a teacher at St. Andrews College in Grahamstown. A couple of my likes is I like anything outdoors, I like all sports, I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie. I like to read, I like to watch movies, but most importantly is I like to watch Survivor. I've been watching Survivor since I was a lighty. I watched every episode of every season. But most importantly, it's been one of my biggest dreams to not just participate in Survivor, but also to win. So I hope that this video proves to you that I should be on Survivor because I'm gonna outwit, outplay, and I'll last everyone. David McKenzie would not get chosen for Survivor. But at least he survived. Thomas Kruger was not as lucky. Was his death a tragic accident? Or an accident waiting to happen? Today, we must ask, was anyone in charge of St. Andrew's College? Who knew what and when? I'm Dion Wiggett, and this is My Only Story, a podcast and a live investigation. On my stoop in Johannesburg, I've been connecting the dots, the dots between 2015 and 2018. If we're going to understand the death of Thomas Kruger back in 2018, we do need to understand the context of the campus against the hill. We must understand how, in 2015, both water polo coach David McKenzie and headmaster Alan Thompson arrived to their new jobs in Grahamstown. And once challenges emerged, we must ask what St. Andrews did to solve a problem like the polo coach. Until a few months ago, I've been looking at St. Andrews from the outside in. I knew I needed an insider someone important in the administration whom I could convince to spill the beans, but would not spill the beans on me. And so, a few months ago, I take my chances. I pick up the phone and I call the man whom everyone said would probably help me. My name is Graham Lucas Bull. I'm 34 years old and I used to be the head of Armstrong House at St. Andrews College. Until six months ago, Graham Lucas Bull was the housemaster of Armstrong House. That's the hostel right next to Espen House, where David McKenzie famously lived. I asked Graham what St. Andrews College is like. It's a magical place. It's got a real soul. It's a salt of the earth kind of place. The teachers are not necessarily the most well-paid teachers in private schooling, but they give more than anywhere else in. 
It's an exciting space. You've got kids from and staff from all over South Africa, Africa and the world. So you learn all the time. Um, nuances, cultures, food. It's a very special place. In fact, Graeme Lucas Bull liked St. Andrews so much, he decided to join it twice. He returns to St. Andrews in 2017 after a stint at his alma mater, St. Stivians, here in Johannesburg. Graeme Lucas Bull arrives at St. Andrews for a second time and moves into Armstrong House which is the residence between Espen House and Steep Somerset Street. But as Graham and his family settle into their new home, there's a controversial polo coach living next door to them. He's a very enthusiastic head of water polo, keen to put St Andrews on the map or as high as possible in terms of water polo program, which I, I could see that even when he was at Pearson. Before joining college, David McKenzie left Pearson High in Windy Summerstrand in Port Elizabeth in 2014. His players would die for him. I mean, they, were, they played exceptional polo for him and, and he had the ability, you know, of dismantling some top sides just through belief of his players. It is the start of 2017 at St. Andrews College in Grahamstown. Next to Graham Lucas Bull in Espen House, Thomas Kruger is now in grade nine and David McKenzie is coaching polo and living it up. But even before the school year starts, some lucky boys get to go on a water polo camp with David McKenzie. One of these boys is Richard Leach, whose college career starts with a water polo camp and will end with spectacular brutality. In January 2017, Richard moves into Espen House. But even before he arrives, he signs up for water polo. I walk into Espen. I was one of the first boys that arrived. Mr. McKenzie shows me where my room is. He coaches the under-14 team and he coaches the first team. And like he was very involved with the boys. It was so easy to see him more as a friend than as a coach. I ask Richard for an example. And he tells me about the night where the grade 8 boys sneak out to streak in three different swimming pools. It's a tradition for the grade 8s to go on a night swim. So we're now leaving Espen. We've gone down to swim in DSG pool. DSG, remember, is the girls' school. Its grounds start right next to Espen House. It's probably 12 o'clock at night. We come back and we hear music from Mr. McKenzie's apartment. To get back into the house, we have to go across the lawn in the bushes and creep along the Espen wall, which is where Mr. McKenzie's apartment window is. So we hear music. I can already smell the smell of weed from like 20 meters away. I mean, it's evident and it's clear that they're obviously smoking, drinking, smoking weed. We knock on his window. Mr. McKenzie opens the window with like a, almost like a frightened face. You can hear other people talking in the background. We tell him, we made it out, we made it. We made it to prep, we made it to DSG. We just went on a night and he's like, okay, cool. Come to my door in Espen and come tell me about it. We go around, knock on his door, he like congratulates all of us, gives us high fives, and then he promises to buy us milkshakes the next day because we had completed the night swim. When Richard moves into Espen House in 2017, another water polo player, Wilder McNutt, has already been living there for three years. My name is Wilder McNutt. I am 21. I'm a student at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I think the first thing everyone would like to know is what exactly the business is with your accent, because it sounds like you've been everywhere. I was raised by a Canadian in the bush in Botswana. Both my brother and I got raised with a North American accent, and then all our friends were like South African or Botswana's. And then, you know, going to boarding school in South Africa, I adopted the the South African accent, but the underlying accent is North American. I ask him what it's like to move into Espen House. It's somewhat of a shock to the system. The amount of power that you don't have over what you do and the amount of power that Mertrix have. You know, that's what shocks most people who aren't ready for it or don't know. Can you give me an example? Everything you get taught from day one is respect staff respect and pretty much everybody older than you and i had that full respect for everybody older than me everybody older than you a sir and ma'am and you greet them just walking past them that's just what you do you take your hat off you tip your cap 
but you wait at doors, you have to literally open and wait at doors for all grade nines, all grade tens, all grade elevens, and all grade twelves. They don't they don't earn respect. They just are older than you. Wilder is two years older than Thomas Krieger, and just like Thomas would, he's arrived at St Andrews with a head full of water polo dreams. I get into grade eight after making provincial water polo team in grade seven and feeling fairly competitive and, and confident in you know, where I am. And so that was important for me, so I, I did pay a lot of attention to it. Two out of three terms, we'd come in early for camp. We met him early, he was at camp. So you, you meet him at camp before you actually meet him at college? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I asked Wilder about his first impression of David McKenzie. What's not to like? You know, he's a young guy, he has energy, he's in the pool with us, he knows a lot about the game. Wilder says that, even in his early days in Espenhaus, it quickly becomes clear that David has his favourites. It wouldn't be, like, crazy obvious, but, you know, people would comment that he's definitely favouritism towards the water polo guys and and his first team in, in general. And I mean, guys that played water polo and are in Espenhaus were... At the beginning, favoritiz- favoritized. So, I mean, did that work out for you? You're a polo player, you're in Espen House. I assumed it would. I mean, at the beginning, it, he was the first team water polo coach, and that's where I wanted to get to, and that, that was my goal. I wanted to have a good relationship with him because he's the person who would ultimately decide whether I played on that team or didn't. Walder tells me about a water polo tour on which he went. Two teachers supervised a selection of boys to go to play in Serbia. The one teacher is polo coach McKenzie, but I've always wondered why a teacher who doesn't coach water polo was picked to accompany McKenzie and the boys to the former Yugoslavia. Graham Lucas Bull was back at college by that point, and he, he coached polo. Wouldn't that have made more sense, for instance? I mean, it would have, but it was somewhat known that Graham and, and David didn't have the fluffiest relationship. It's true. There is nothing fluffy to the relationship between Mackenzie and Lucas Bull. By the beginning of 2018, the feud is full-blown. That is when a parent tells Lucas Bull some disturbing news. The red flag started going up after sort of team-building events that were hosted at St. Francis. And that's when I was made aware by a parent there potentially was some drinking happening at these things. who didn't want to come forward and didn't want to put anything on record and just asked me if I could just raise a flag. I then sort of started observing things on the side of the pool, interactions at school, and it was just too familiar. It was too buddy-buddy. It was too arm over the shoulder, arms on legs, hugs, jokes, you know, all this stuff that is just not teacher-student or coach-student relationship. It's, it's a very much an equal level footing kind of relationship, which you don't, in my opinion, I don't think that's appropriate. Lucas Bull knows he has a legal responsibility to report. Fortunately, it should be easy. Headmaster Alan Thompson is known across campus for his open-door policy. If you tell me there's an open-door policy, I walk in, and I love that about Alan Thompson. I could see him whenever I needed. He gave me an answer when I needed it, even though it wasn't a nice one. Uh, or the right answer that I was looking for, perhaps, but I, I knew what I got. I tell him that there are some concerns that I have and uh, parents have voiced to me that there is too familiar relationship or too familiar connection between Dave McKenzie and, and his players. And his response is kind of acknowledging it, kind of a surprise in a way, because... Dave McKenzie is this kind of blue-eyed boy in the staff room. And I'm the new kid on the block. But as anyone in a position like that would be, you'd have some, you know, some suspicion what's up here. At that stage, you know, it's nothing. I've only thing I've heard is potential there's potential drinking or something that's happened on it. And there's is, and it's and certainly what I've seen is that it's, it's too familiar. Does Alan Thompson seem surprised? It was kind of a response that you need proof before me I act on anything. Uh, I'm not going to just act on hearsay and have a knee-jerk kind of reaction. So this was February 2018. In Graeme Lucas Bull's telling, 
Alan Thompson seemed surprised. However, this does not quite square with the pile of documents I have managed to get hold of. On the day when Lucas Bull waltzes through Alan Thompson's open door, the headmaster is knees-deep in the fallout of another McKenzie investigation that started a full year earlier, in February 2017. It involves two different boys and their parents. One of the boys was Walder McNutt. For almost two years now, he says, his deputy housemaster, David McKenzie, had been making his life hell. We'll get into the details next time. But, like so many things, it started with a polo tournament. We are at St. Andrew's College. It is early 2015, Wilder is in grade 9, and his mother, Leslie McNutt, has come to watch him play polo. That is where she meets David McKenzie for the first time. She has a very routine request. She asks McKenzie to find Wilder a tutor in mathematics. The question was, can you find him a tutor? And he said, I will do it. You know, my mom was a little put off by his overly familiar attitude towards me and and helping out, I guess. So you arrive in his flat, you go to sit at the desk and you take out your maths books. There is no desk in his flat. And so I sat down uh, just on the couch with him. I have, you know, my maths books and I have my pencil case and we and started to chat, talk about my marks and what's going on. You sit on a couch and you don't in, actually do any maths. Looking back on all of that now, what do you make of it? His manner is somewhat familiar. I mean, I was confused at the time. I went for a maths lesson, but nothing happened. There was no maths done. There was no schoolwork done. You know, there was. it was not what I was expecting because I left doing nothing. I, and I never went back. He, I mean, he drove it. No maths was done. It was obviously not the plan. You know, I would never offer it again. Never followed up. I do think that he heard something he didn't want to hear and just left it. In the end, Wilder had to find his own maths tutor. The first time I'd actually been in his apartment I was in grade eight. He had promised me hot chocolate. So I walk into his room, he's got like a couch, a TV, and he makes me hot chocolate. And we just sit on his couch and just chat. It felt a bit weird in the sense that there was no other teacher that would ever do that. But I mean, at the same time, it, I didn't really see him as the same as any other teacher. If Mr. Pretorius, my housemaster, had invited me for a chocolate, that to me would feel a whole lot worse and more uncomfortable than Mr. McKenzie invited me. So it only felt uncomfortable in literally first 20 seconds, maybe even 10. But after that, you settle down, he makes you feel comfortable. He chats to you like you're his friend, not like he's talking down on you. If a different teacher, like Mr. for like that hug. Earlier in our interview, Richard told me about the day when another teacher demanded a hug from him. That felt weird because I'm not friends with Mr. He is my So if he had to do the stuff that Mr. McKenzie did, yes, I'd feel very uncomfortable, extremely uncomfortable, but not if Mr. McKenzie does it or if one of my mates do it. Now that I'm a boarding house master, I'm checking that boys are in their bed and I notice that boys are missing and they should be in my boarding house at nine o'clock at night or, you know, at after roll call and they're not there. And I find out that, you know, they're having extra lessons with David McKenzie in his flat. And apparently it had been going on for the year preceding and I wasn't aware of this. My message to David McKenzie was, you need to let me know who you're seeing and when you're seeing them so I can I know exactly where they are because that's part of the job. These boys are then coming and going to his flat quite often for quite lengthy times. They've got academic challenges with certain subjects that he is helping them with, but certainly that is, it's just bizarre. It's just weird. What am I supposed to do with this? So I voiced it again. 
I go again to Alan Thompson and I voice my feelings of the appropriateness of these meetings. I start questioning the behavior and the appropriateness of behavior and I make it very clear that I don't think it's appropriate. I think I'm given the cold shoulder. I'm shunned. I'm told if I don't have evidence, then I must just carry on. There's a very fine line between grooming and appropriate and inappropriate behaviours. This is social worker Lisa Wilkin, who works at a school in Johannesburg. Like last time, we're talking to her in her son's playroom. She tells me something that shocks me. Unless a school has a policy that explicitly restricts social interactions between teachers and learners, the teachers get to reach out to the children as often as a child allows. What is your teacher allowed to and not allowed to do with learners? Are you allowed to WhatsApp a learner privately on their cell phone from your private cell phone, which should be considered inappropriate? But if a school doesn't regulate those things from their side, there's not much that you can say, because a school can say that this is the parent's responsibility. The parents should be checking what is happening on their WhatsApp. We'll be looking at WhatsApp a lot more in this series because I am deeply worried about how insidious WhatsApp is. And and I've seen evidence of where it starts. A legit desire, which is, say, a sporting coach and his under-15 squad have a WhatsApp group because Mm -hmm. the coach can say, okay, guys, we're practicing at 3.30 this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Remember to bring your speedos. Is that necessary? Within a school, there's always forms of communications, there's newsletters, even if you give a child a piece of paper in their hand, they will get that information. It should never be necessary for a teacher to WhatsApp a learner personally. For your own protection as a teacher, why are you opening up that personal communication between yourself, your personal cell phone and a personal cell phone of a child? I decide to ask Lisa some outrageous questions. In what circumstances would you say it is appropriate for a teacher to share alcohol with students? It would be illegal for a teacher to share alcohol with a student. It would never be appropriate. I mean, even in a high school setting where a child is 18, it would never be appropriate. Under 18, it would be inappropriate and illegal. But even if the child is 18, there's no reason. There's no reason for a teacher to be drinking with a child ever. A teacher is employed to do a job, to look after the well-being of a child, to teach a child. They are not employed to socialize with a child under any circumstances. Would it be appropriate for a teacher in a residence to have boys in the residence Mm -hmm. over for movies in the evening in his room? Whether it is a movie after school, a school camp, a drink, a cigarette, there should never be any reason for a teacher who is a professional person to socialize with a learner ever, never under any circumstances. It undermines the teaching relationship and it opens up so many aspects of grooming. An adult should be friends with adults. There should never be a reason for an adult to be friends with a child. By 2018, Richard Leach is a regular in David McKenzie's flat. But his parents smell a rat. One morning in his grade nine year, Richard's dad drives him and his older brother to St. Andrew's College in Grahamstown. I'm sitting in the car, my brothers are in the car, we're on the way back to school, and my dad had already noticed that I was getting close to Mr. McKenzie. He would tell me, Mr. McKenzie's not a good person, don't trust Mr. McKenzie, don't go to his room, don't do any of that, don't don't trust Mr. McKenzie. I would fight for Mr. McKenzie. I would say, no dad, it's, it's not what it looks like, Mr. McKenzie's a good person. Like, I would even lie. I would know that Mr. McKenzie is doing all these things, like partying with Matrix and partying with the Polo Oaks. But I'd say, I promise you, like, he doesn't drink, like, he doesn't, he doesn't do anything with the boys, he doesn't party, everything's fine, like, he doesn't do anything weird. Like, I don't know why you don't like him. I don't understand. Like, Dad, I, I don't want anyone to hate me because I'm cutting Mr. McKenzie off. Like, there were just so many, so many ways that I would try and convince my dad that Mr. McKenzie was a good person. See, the thing is, in the moment, there wasn't one point where I felt uncomfortable. Because first of all, like even people that are not in our school say like, oh, St. Andrews Oaks touch them, like touch each other so much. Like they're so like affectionate, even towards their mates. Just even from Mr. McKenzie, because you don't see him as a teacher, you see him as a friend. 
if he puts his arm around you, like it's chilled. Like sometimes you'd put your hand on like your mate's lap. If he does that, like it's chilled. You don't find it weird because of the way that he's made himself like your friend. So a teacher put his hand on your lap? Yeah, I mean like on your on your leg. Like or like like just like there's like things you do to your mates that he does. And even like I would see him do it to other boys, like it's just it's just like he's one of us. So it wasn't anything different from the affection we give to our mates. While David McKenzie is busy befriending Richard, it is clear to Walter McNutt that he has not made the cut. People would go into his room, watch movies, you know, have a couple beers. It was also fairly known that he would let some guys who were either in the sand or just didn't want to go to school just hang out in his room for the day and bunk class. That was fairly known around the boys. By the end of his grade 11 year, October 2017, Wilder's mental health has started to collapse. It was third term, half term, and I was just somewhat in a dark place, and I, I didn't quite know why or how. By now, his parents have grown deeply concerned. They were worried to the point, you know, what's changed? Like, what's the problem? Trying to just figure out what has happened. After the half term, my dad was flying back the next day to Botswana. But they really wanted to do something before he left. His parents decide to go see Headmaster Thompson about David McKenzie. And had messaged Alan Thompson and said, can we have a meeting in the morning? And they had the meeting first thing in the morning. What follows is one of the most shocking incidents of this entire story. Not because it involves sex or drinking or drugs. There isn't even overt violence. Just sheer terror. Maybe that's why this incident gets to me like it does. The setting is so ordinary. The 16-year-old Walden McNutt wakes up in his bedroom in Espen House. I wake up, I go to breakfast, finish breakfast, back in my room by, you know, 7.05, just about to brush my teeth and head out to go to school starting at 7.30. David barges into my room tells my roommate to get out the room, closes the door. He came, walked straight up. He came quite close. I was sitting down on my bed, and then I was looking up. What's your problem with me? Like, do you have a problem with me? What's your mom's problem? Why is your mom meeting the headmaster this morning? Is it about me? I was probably like 5'8 at the time. 1.73 meters. And said, so, yeah, I'm not a big guy. So, yeah, it was even more of a presence. I have no idea that this meeting is even going on. I was just like, what, what, what the hell did my mum do? His mum had done plenty. She'd been insisting to the headmaster that he needs to take steps to keep her son safely in the care of college. Her entreaties to headmaster Thompson would eventually lead to an extraordinary intervention by an HR consultant. Yes, an HR consultant. It would result in a report that I call the Great Whitewash. But more on that later. The school would never say so, but at St Andrews College, it seems like violence is part of everyday life. Up until now, this podcast has focused on intimate violence, but institutional violence appears to be rife. I've interviewed dozens of old Andrians, and each has a story of multiple beatings and lashings, both received and inflicted. I ask former housemaster Graeme Lucas Bull whether there is a massive problem with violence on the St. Andrews campus. I don't think it's a massive problem, but I do think there's a problem. I was involved in a very uh, horrible uh, lashing incident towards the end of last year where criminal charges were laid and an expulsion was on the table. And there was a court case and all sorts of things. It was horrific, and I was devastated that this stuff was still going on. And, and I was led to believe it is. It happens quite a bit. But it's not a St. Andrews thing. It's not a, it's a boarding school thing. Later on, I sent Graham a video clip I was unfortunate enough to receive. It's from Mespen House, and in the clip, two boys are fighting each other for a bed. Everyone, fight! 
one of the boys still looks like a kid. But here he is being beaten on his head and shoved hard into the corner of a cupboard. Aside from the two boys fighting, there are at least three other boys in the room. There's the kid who's filming. We can see another kid who is also videoing the scene. But what really catches my eye is the boy who's eating pizza. He's perched high on a wooden locker and he jeers on the two fighters. On his lap is a pizza box and in his hand is a half-eaten slice. Within four minutes, Graham responds to the video I just sent him. He writes, this is absolutely shocking. I cannot believe what I have just watched. This is disgusting. That court case Graham was talking about, it happened in December 2020, you know, the end of last year. In an urgent application before the Eastern Cape High Court in Grahamstown, a father from St. Andrews lodges an affidavit. His son had been expelled for lashing a pupil, but, the father argues, the school disregarded, quote, the culture of bullying and lashing and the attendant code of silence, which clearly exists at the school and are endemic to an extent that pupils such as my son have become desensitized to violence and believe that a parallel disciplinary structure enforced by pupils against pupils is the norm, end quote. The father carries on to state that his son, quote, has been the victim of bullying and lashing in the context of his sport, water polo, and in his boarding house, end quote. The boarding house is Espen. In his responding affidavit, Headmaster Thompson denies there is a code of silence at St. Andrews College. Regarding claims that violence and bullying are endemic at college, Thompson writes, quote, I deny that I am aware of any endemic problem and that I have chosen not to act or take steps to address the problem, end quote. Thompson also supplies a surprising statistic to the High Court. In 2016 and 2017, he says, seven boys received final warnings for bullying. Quote, and 22 received warnings in the same period. End quote. In the middle of all these proceedings is one of the kids we've been talking to. The now 18-year-old Richard Leach. So I'm on Nolling Field and we're playing into our soccer. So I'm there with a bunch of friends just chilling, chatting to my mates and I get a voice note. The voice note says, Yo, is fucked up again. He murdered So we got to go fuck him up. They call into, into his room. So now we're talking to trying to sort things out, tell him what he's done wrong, make sure it doesn't happen again. There's about eight of us in the room. In my mind, at St. Andrews, if you commit a sin, there's a price to pay, which is being lashed. In all my interviews with Richard, he's spoken with astonishing openness. You'll see more of what I mean in just a few moments. But there is one incident that has always been off bounds. He does not want to talk about the details of the brutal lashing he gave to a fellow Andrian. He arrives in Espen. That's when the lashing takes place. Then after that, I had Intel's rugby. We go play our Intel's game. And then I'm sitting with... And, and then we hear rumors that told the teachers that we've lashed him. Richard Leach and two other boys get caught for lashing a fellow Andrian. Richard is summoned to a disciplinary hearing and he is expelled from St. Andrews College. He was represented at the disciplinary hearing by one of his teachers, Graham Lucas Bull. I've been struggling to reconcile this extremely violent Richard with this extremely sweet kid I've met a number of times now. Yeah, so you and me both. Yo, I was one of Richard's biggest supporters. Uh, I think he was a fantastic young man. 
I say was. I mean, he, he is a fantastic young man. He's, uh, he's polite and he's sweet and he's helpful and he's a great sportsman and a good kid. Um, that's the Richard I knew. Then this incident happened where he lashed and brutally lashed one of the boys in Armstrong House. And I couldn't believe it was the same person. And then obviously subsequently, you know, then you, you're told, you know, that he had anger problems and he had snap and he'd shit on people and he'd beat people before and whatever, whatever. But, you know, you hear all of that after the fact. If I knew Richard prior to him lashing. I would have said to you that he's one of the, one of the better kids at St. Andrews, a solid kid, would die for his school. And then he did that, and, which was criminal. I would have pressed charges if that was my son that he did that too. Look, he made a mistake and, and I forgive him for it. One day we'll share a beer together and, and look back at it and hopefully um, things he's learned a, a really hard lesson from it. And I also heard post-incident that a lot of this stuff was happening and boys that I had in higher esteem, their names were coming up in terms of the lashes as well. And it uncovered a, a quite a nasty sort of toxic kind of situation. I can't believe that stuff is still going on. And I also cannot believe that that we as a school, as, a, as St. Andrews, have not moved past that somehow. And I know a lot of work has gone into trying to stop it. I know a lot of time and effort has gone into trying to educate boys to make better decisions. But I don't know why kids want to do that at a boarding school. Why do they want to beat someone up to build them up? I'm not here to justify the brutality that Richard and his mates inflicted upon another boy. But just because you've done something wrong does not mean you lose your right to speak up. So it's different from having another coach. I mean, he gets in the pool and when you have a practice match, he joins. When you do drills, he joins. But often I'd find that he uses like his hands and grabs your costume more than like any other player. In water polo, costume grabbing is forbidden, but very common. Basically, a player would grip their opponent's swimming costume underwater to pull them further away from the ball and you closer. I've had coaches that have coached me in the pool and they, they're like, they don't grab your costume at all. You'll grab the side of your costume where your waist is or you would grab from behind or just like in front of your leg in the front. Those are like the the most common places for your hand to start. But I mean, polo is a rough sport. So when he grabs your costume, you try and get his grip off. So obviously you're going to try and move around. And as that's happening, his hand is literally moving across your, your whole waist area. So around that whole region, I mean, his hand is moving around that area. I mean, he puts his hand in your costume, grabs it. And when you're trying to move away, his hand will go across your, like across your, I mean, you go across your crotch, go across your ass. Like his, his hand is touching things that it's not meant to be touching. His hand is touching like your private parts because of the way that you move in water polo. I mean, I've played games against like older parents. I've played games against my friend's dad's polo team. And all of them, every time I play against an older man, they're like, they don't go near your costume. They know it's inappropriate. I mean, I know when I play against, like, all boys, when we play against girls, like, we, st we don't go near, like, their private parts because you know it's inappropriate. But, I mean, with, with Mr. McKenzie, like, it was so different. You would always grab your costume constant, like, every single practice. Every time he marks you, he's grabbing your costume. I mean, there's times where he doesn't need to do it. Like, let's say the ball's not near us and he's not trying to set up for like a good position, he'll, his hand will still just be there near your costume. Even if it's not in your costume, his hand will be like here where your waist is. It's never, it's never in like a normal position, just like on your back or, I mean, sometimes it is, but most of the time he's grabbing your costume. I don't, I mean, like when you play against your mates, when you play against opposition, it is normal. It is part of the game. But personally, I just feel like an older, I mean, your water polo coach is an older man. I mean, I'm, I was 15 years old at the time when he was doing this to me. And yes, I saw him as a friend and that's why I didn't find it weird at the time. But now looking back at it, yes, 
if I knew what I knew now back then, then I definitely would have spoken to someone or spoken up about it because it was, I mean, it was inappropriate and I was wrong. I mean, the amount of times his hand has probably rubbed across my, my genitals or gone behind where my ass is or just touch things that it's not meant to be touching. It's, like, I wouldn't, like, I can't even put a number on it, but I mean, more than 10, more than, I mean, I've, he coached me for a long time. So in all those practices, I mean, every time he gets in the pool and I'm marking him, which is quite often in the practices. So, I mean, I mean, there wasn't a practice where he didn't use my costume. Unless there was a practice where we, there was no like physical marking and stuff. So, I mean, countless times, so many times. I ask Richard if he thinks his experience is unique. I mean, no, I'm no different from another boy, so I don't believe I'm the only one. In the Eastern Cape, it is July 2018. Here's Charles Kruger. We returned to Port Elizabeth after having found Tom three o'clock in the morning at Pride Rock, where I thought I'd found him dead. Um, days later, I make contact with Alan Thompson to arrange a meeting to explain to him what's happened. I arrive on time for the meeting. I walk into his very regal office. I'd never been in there before. And we sit down and start chatting. I explained to him that we had come to move in Grahamstown. We've literally turned our lives upside down for our son, as I'm sure most parents would do. And I say to him, Alan, I've come to live in Grahamstown for three months to overturn every stone looking for the scorpion that's upsetting my child. I have overturned most of the stones, and I haven't found a scorpion. There's one specific stone that concerns me, and that is the case of Dave McKenzie and the influence he's had on Thomas. But I can't overturn the stone. Upon which he replies, there have been some allegations, but there's been no proof of anything in that many words. You know, but again, it's going to be his word against mine. But that's what he said. And I said, look, I've, we've decided we're taking Tom out of school. Yeah, and that's where we left it. By this point, in July 2018, David McKenzie has already signed a boy out of the sanatorium, has already left St. Andrews, has already joined Grey College in Bloemfontein. So by the point where Shaul Kruger warns Alan Thompson against David McKenzie, Alan Thompson appears to already have gone to great trouble to suppress the messages that Graham Lucas Bull found on the phone of the boy who was signed out of the sand. To remind you quickly, the day after Mackenzie signed a boy out of the sanatorium, Graham Lucas Bull confiscated the boy's phone. It contained an excruciatingly intimate conversation between Mackenzie and the boy. In one instance, Mackenzie wrote the following to this boy. Quote, I loved the last 24 hours, but this is impacting my job. I want to talk to you every day and see you every day. We just have to be clever now. Emoji of a flexing arm. Nothing changes between us, I promise. We can still do things. You can come and visit when you say you are visiting. End quote. And also, quote, we have to start playing a bit of a game now. When you speak to Bull, mention that I have said I will not be tutoring you anymore. Say that you feel very unhappy and alone now. If you don't mind, I have a plan. Do you trust me? End quote. And the schoolboy responds, of course I do. The 7th of June, I received an email from the headmaster, and this was before the actual hearing happens. There's a whole bunch of investigation. The school's lawyer has been brought in, and he's in and out of the office, so evidently things are happening. There's a very real situation at foot. Graham had not shared the messages he confiscated with anyone. He's sitting in his office in Armstrong House when he receives an email. It's from headmaster Alan Thompson. Dear Graham, I'm involved in the matters concerning the events of the 2nd of June, of which you are aware. I reiterate the confidential nature of the material that we have shared in this context and reiterate the extreme confidentiality of same. 
I'm told, although this has not been verified and I do not believe it to be true, that you have shared this material and warn you of the extremely serious nature of the material and the devastating consequences of any such action. Thank you, Alan Thompson. I was quite nervous when I got this email because I thought, shit, this is, this is quite serious. I mean, what, what, who, have I, who have I shared it with? I had to think about who I shared it with. What is he meaning here? Is, he, is, he, is this a threat at me? You know, that, I, that there's, there could be severe consequences. Is he saying that I could lose my job? I don't know. It just, that was the tone of the email. Yeah, so I was quite worried about that. But also in the same breath, I was very aware of what this, the stuff I've seen is criminal. And if it comes back, which I know these things always do, I need to make sure I'm prepared. So I did save the stuff onto a hard drive uh, and kept it. Um, and and in time, the warrant officer, Geico, who was investigating a matter involved in the case, I did hand over that information to him. This was the warrant officer from the SA Police Service when Tom's death was briefly investigated. Hours after the email was sent, David McKenzie is gone. What follows is an affirming month for the polo coach. In his telling, in his first month away, he gets job offers from several different schools. We'll be naming and asking them next time. But a month after leaving St. Andrews, he accepts a position at Grey College. You know, Grey College in Bloemfontein, which happens to be where our season one antagonist was quietly let go in August 1990. Almost exactly 28 years later, in July 2018, David McKenzie would arrive at the school and in its polo pool. From the evidence that I have seen, it doesn't seem to take McKenzie long to do at Grey what he did at college. Most alarmingly, maybe, are the events that are starting to take shape by the start of 2019 and the frequency and pattern of some mysterious code phrases. We are talking here about stroke correction about bacon, about peaky blinders, and about Harry Potter. It's time that I tell you about two mysterious pictures I have found. It is late one night on the stoop when the source I'm calling Deep Throat comes through for me. These two photos are what iPhone calls live photos. That is to say, when you take a picture, your phone also captures the seconds before and after the actual photo is taken. I'm sorry to belabor a technological point, but it's important. When you take a so-called live photo, you're really recording a tiny piece of video. You get to see what happened just before the picture was taken, and you also get to see what happened just afterwards. And so it is that one night on the stoop, I get hold of two live photos. You can see the two pictures at myonlystory.org and on news24.com, but because they are live photos, I can play you the sound now. Yeah, I look shaded. <sighs> the pictures appear to be taken in David McKenzie's flat in Espen House. In the first one, we can see a half-naked David McKenzie with a half-naked Thomas Kruger and three other half-naked boys, none of whom have featured in this podcast. There are phrases written on the boys' bodies in a thick black marker, along with drawings that make me think of pigs and slabs of meat. In the second picture, we see Thomas again, along with two other boys from the first picture. Thomas looks scared and humiliated. He is standing in front of the two boys, both of whom has his name written on their chests. One of the boys has Tom Beast written on his pick. The other boy's chest reads Tom Cat. David McKenzie is not in the live photo, but we hear his voice at the end. He appears to be calling something or someone effing pathetic. What the actual is going on here? Is this a smoking gun? That's what it feels like. Trouble is, I don't understand what I'm looking at. Can you maybe help me? (laughs) 
as interesting as David McKenzie is, we must put a pin in him for the remaining minutes of this episode. David McKenzie does not come out of nowhere. He forms part of a water polo fraternity that has been attracting controversy from the coast through central South Africa to the high felt and beyond. Predatory behavior does not start somewhere. It has been with us always, like cancer and lice. But as far as a story can have a start, we may as well start this one in PE. It is 2006, 15 years ago, and David McKenzie is a matric pupil at Gray High School in Port Elizabeth. Yes, it's confusing, but two famous boys' schools are called Gray. Gray College is in Bloemfontein, and Gray High is in PE. So at Gray High in PE, McKenzie is in matric. Along with his twin brother, he is a star water polo player under the starriest of coaches. It is Dean Carlson. You may remember Dean Carlson from his arrest earlier this year in Australia. The colourful figure of Dean Carlson has cast its shadow across polo for the past 20 years. As far as mysteries go, his was not so much an open secret as a casual conspiracy. It seems like almost everyone knew about Dean Carlson, and almost everyone said nothing. I'll play you an example in just a moment. To solve a problem like water polo, we need to connect the dots. Who knew what and when? For instance, it is 2018, two months before the death of Thomas Kruger, when big news rocks the water polo fraternity. At Pearson High, in Windy Summerstrand in Port Elizabeth, Dean Carlser has just been demoted. David McKenzie sends a WhatsApp to a number of different polo coaches. They all receive the exact same query. Quote, what is happening with Dean Carlser at Pearson? End quote, writes David McKenzie. And then, quote, I heard his transgressions eventually caught up. End quote. If McKenzie's tone sounds casual, it's because it is. It seems like everyone knew about Dean Carlson. That's certainly what the following voice note suggests. It is from one water polo teacher to another, and she appears to find Dean Carlson's moves a laughing matter. Do you recognize the woman in this voice note? Dean is trouble, and he has proven that over and over again. And although he has his moments where he can be really sweet and kind and nice, he is generally really fucked up. And I would even say, like, yeah, just unstable, narcissistic, manipulative, fiddles with the boys. <laughs> it's just not, um, I don't think, you just know, you know exactly what's going to happen. Hilarious. Fiddles with the boys. <laughs> Who knew what about Dean Carlson and when? Was this laughing woman the only one who knew? Of course not. Next time on My Only Story. Last night, as the first thunderstorm of the summer blazed around our studio in Johannesburg, we reflected on a week of the highest of drama, during which David McKenzie tried and failed to interdict this podcast, and the chairman of the St. Andrews School Governing Body announced a full review into the school and headmaster's response to the McKenzie affair. Yesterday morning, Wednesday, David McKenzie's lawyer approached the Eastern Cape High Court with an urgent interdict to prevent publication of my only story. In McKenzie's founding affidavit, he objects to the allegedly defamatory content of the past two episodes, but he does not offer any response to the allegations about his conduct. As our lawyers were finalizing their response, McKenzie's legal team suddenly decided to abandon their application, while promising this is not the end of the matter. Our lawyers will be seeking legal costs for dragging them all the way down to the Eastern Cape for nothing.
Meanwhile, in the absence of any word from Mackenzie, we have to substitute his response with a voice note he sent to a former friend. Hello! I was just thinking, crazy idea, impulsive. Let's go watch the Springboks in Pretoria on Saturday. What do you think? But his employment situation has grown more complicated. Following the release of episode two, the Redham School in Bedford View in Johannesburg placed Mackenzie on precautionary suspension. He is due to appear before a disciplinary hearing tomorrow, Friday 1 October, in Johannesburg. In a letter to him, the school writes that the relationship between it and Mackenzie has broken down irretrievably. The school carries on to tell Mackenzie it has, quote, lost all confidence in your ability to continue working as both a teacher and master in charge of water polo, end quote. You can keep on following this story at news24.com. We can also find more reaction by Redham, Gray College and Eastern Gauteng School's water polo, who last week asked Mackenzie to step down as coach pending an investigation. Meanwhile, in Grahamstown, Alan Thompson's responses have veered from dignified to defamatory. We gave him another long list of questions this week. You can read them, plus his answers, at news24.com or via myonlystory.org. In a letter last week to the Andrian community, Thompson stated that he had received two formal and two informal complaints about David McKenzie. In response to specific questions from News24 this week, Thompson could confirm that six people informed him of alleged inappropriate conduct by Mackenzie. They include Walden McNutt's mother, Richard Leach's father, Graham Lucas Bull, one other parent, and at least two other teachers. Thompson denies that his email to Lucas Bull was an attempt to suppress the information, but rather to protect the privacy of the learners implicated. Quote, there was absolutely no reason for me to threaten Mr. Lucas Bull or anyone else. End quote. Alan Thompson also specifically denies that Charles Kruger ever spoke to him about David McKenzie. This week we also sent questions to Jacko Maria, who is the chairman of the school governing body. He says that Alan Thompson kept him updated regarding the two formal and two informal complaints. But he did announce a full review. Quote, as each weekly podcast and article is released, New information, cell phone clips and allegations of which the school was previously unaware continue to emerge. Once all relevant information has been released, I will ensure that the council conducts a full review of the school's actions in this matter. End quote. He said the review would include, quote, the response of the school's management and the headmaster. End quote. There's at least one point where the headmaster and the chairman speak as one. At the bottom of both of their replies, both of them write, quote, I do not intend to answer any further questions until the review described in three above has been completed, end quote. In other words, for the remainder of the season, Alan Thompson and Jacko Maria do not intend to answer further questions. As for us, we'll be asking more anyway. This has been a bumper episode of My Only Story. And next week, we're taking a mid-season production break. Almost all South African schools are on holiday next week, and we've got our work cut out. As our live investigation goes into hyperdrive, I still rely on your tips and tip-offs via myonlystory.org. We'll see you two weeks from now for the second half of our season. My Only Story is written and edited by me, Dion Wiggett. The executive producer is Alison Pope. The associate producer is Noctula Magnati. And the sound engineer is Sean Jeffress. The original score is by Charles Johann Lingenfelder. Our artwork is by Kalla Kriese. Additional reporting by News 24's Sesolna Nkakamba. Their production manager is Charlene Ruet. And their editor-in-chief, Adrian Basson, is our editorial advisor. Special thanks to Sheldon Marias and Paula Badife. Whoever you are, please continue sending me your information and your tip-offs. You can contact me completely confidentially at myonlystory.org or message us on WhatsApp or Telegram on 071-382-7030. Myonlystory.org is also the place to go for bonus materials and loads of resources about recovering from sexual abuse. At myonlystory.org, there are loads of links to people to talk to 
depending on where you are in the world. If you're in South Africa, you can always, always phone SADAG on 0800 456 789. It's sequential and easy to remember. 0800 456 789. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow the developments all week long at news24.com. This project was supported by Truth First and is made possible by contributions from people like you. This has been a co-production of the My Only Story non-profit company and News24.